Hello, welcome to session three of data communication. In this session, we'll be looking at data transmission. Transmission of data occurs between the transmitter and the receiver over some transmission medium, which we've seen in our earlier slide. Now, here we will talk about the direct link. The direct link is used to refer to the transmission path between these two devices, the receiver and the transmitter. Now here, a signal is being propagated directly from the tr transmitter to the receiver with no intermediate devices. Now, intermediate devices, we can look at a picture of having device A going to device C. Now, if device A is com connected directly to device C using a cable, which we are calling the transmission medium, then that is a direct link. Now, if device A would have to go through device B before getting to device C, that forfeits that direct link. So it means that device A is going through another hub or another device to get to C. Now, a transmission medium here too can be of three types. We can have the simplest, we have the half duplex, and the full duplex. It all comes back to the same meaning that we give, we're giving to it. So simplex transmission has to do with a unidirectional way of communicating. Half duplex has to do with communication to both or in both direction, but one at a time. Then full duplex transmission has to do with both direction simultaneously. Now, then we we'll look at what a signal is. This is a function of time. So a signal is a function of time, which can be expressed also as a function of frequency. So we'll be looking at two various types of concepts, which we are calling the time division or the time domain concept and the frequency domain concept. Now, with the, when, when a, a signal is expressed as a function, its signal com, consists of components of different frequency. So a time domain concept is viewed as a function of time, and an electromagnetic signal can be either continuous or discrete. So in a time domain concept, we, can, we look at both the continuous nature and the discrete nature. Now, a continuous signal is one in which the signal intensity varies in a smooth fashion over time, looks like a curve or a wave or a, a sine wave, where the discrete signal is one in which the signal intensity maintains a constant level for some period of time. And here we see the, the, the graph in a form of a bar chart or a histogram. Now this is how a continuous time domain concept looks like, and this is how a discrete time domain concept looks like. Now, the continuous signal might represent speech, and the discrete signal might represent binary values, zeros and ones. Now you know with speech, it's not it's not discrete, it's continuous. It's in the form of waves. Now, the simplest sort of signal is known as a periodic signal, and in which the same signal pattern repeats itself over time, over one period. Now, a general sine wave can be used to, to be represented by three parameters. We, we have the amplitude, we have the frequency, and we have the phase. Now, the amplitude is the peak value or the strength of the signal over time. This is measured in volts or watts. Then we have the frequency being the rate at which the signal repeats itself. This rate is in cycles per second, measured in hertz. Then we have the phase, which is a, a measure of the relative position in time within a single period of a signal. Then we have the frequency domain concept. And this is concerned with only the peak value and the frequencies. Like I said in the earlier slide, here we have different or varying frequency coming into play. Now, the frequency domain is more compact and useful when you are dealing with more than one sine wave, which we are saying the spectrum of a signal is the range of frequencies that it, it can contain or that it contains. So we have 
some spectrum. Ghana, we have a spectrum that we deal with that various frequencies pick their signals from. So you, you can realize that in Ghana, we have so many radio stations. We have so many TV stations. These are all form, or this all form part of the spectrum that we have. Then we have the absolute bandwidth of a signal. And this is the width of the spectrum. So we have a, a spectrum varieties of frequencies. Now, the absolute bandwidth is the width of these spectrum. Then we have the analog and digital data transmission. So in transmitting data from a source to the destination, we need to be concerned of the nature of data they are transmitting. Are you transmitting an analog data or a digital data? Are you transmitting an analog signal or a digital signal? Now, these two terms will be used frequently in data communication. And we'll be talking about data signaling and transmission in those three contexts. So for data, we have analog data, which takes on continuous values. Then we have the digital data that takes on discrete values. So an, an example of a, an analog data has to do with a voice or video. And an example of the digital data has to do with text or integers or numbers. Then we have signals. So we have, just like we have analog data, we have analog signals. And this is a continuous variation of uh, electromagnetic waves that may be propagated over a variety of media, depending on what spectrum you're in or what frequency you are using. Then we have the dig digital signal being sequence of voltage pulses. Already we said digital signals deals with zeros and ones. They are a form of binaries. And this may be transmitted over a wire media or medium. Then we have transmission also. So just like we have transmission, uh, analog data, analog signal, we have analog transmission. And it's a means of transmitting analog signals without regards to their content. Meanwhile, digital transmission concerns or is concerned with the content of the signal. So a digital signal can be transmitted only or can only transmit a limited or can be transmitted over a limited distance before attenuation sets in. Now we'll look at what attenuation is later in this section. So this is a summary of analog and digital data transmission put in a table. We want to look at transmission impairments. Now, with any communication system, the received signals differ from the transmitted signal due to some transmission impairments. Now, for analog signal, this impairment or what we inhibit our transmission or what will prevent us from getting quality data at the other end, which at the receiving end, is what we are calling the impairments of data. For analog signal, these impairments can degrade the signal quality. So for digital signals, we are looking at bit errors being introduced. Now, the most significant impairment we want to look at are attenuation and attenuation distortion, delay distortion, and noise. So when you look at the block diagram, attenuation has been broken down into three main components. Or impairment causes have been broken down into three, attenuation, distortion, and noise. Now, attenuation is where the signal of a, or the strength of a signal falls off with regards to distance over any transmission medium. Now, we later come and see that with the kind of medium that we have goes with the kind of length or kind of cable length that is needed. For example, a UTP cable should have a minimum of, or a maximum of 100 meters with regards to the length of its cable. Now, once the length increases, attenuation sets in. So attenuation comes in where the signal of uh, the data being transmitted falls off with regards to distance. So we can see that here is the original signal. Take note of the 
to the waves from one point going to the other end. Now, once attenuation sets in, we see that the amplitude of the signal changes. This is increased. In other words, the original signal is being amplified. Take note of the peak value here as compared to this. This is of a higher peak. So once the original signal is being attenuated, we have an amplified signal. And this means that attenuation has set in. So from point 1 to point 2, the signal is being amplified. And we have that amplified signal at point 3. And this is due to the distance in our medium, transmission medium. Now, attenuation introduces three considerations for our network engineers or our transmission engineers. First of all, a received signal must have sufficient strength so that the electromagnetic circuitry in the receiver can detect that signal. Once the signal is weak, the electromagnetic circuitry cannot detect that signal, hence the signal falls off. Now, the signal also must maintain a level sufficiently higher than noise. Now, we'll see that in every transmission, there's some level of noise. We'll discuss that earlier on in, or later on in this slide. Then, attenuation also varies with frequencies. So, per the frequency that you are using on the spectrum, you are likely to have attenuation or not. Now, the measurement or the unit of measurement for either a loss or gain of signal is known as decibel. So decibel is the unit of measurement of, of a loss or for a loss or gain of a signal. And this measures or decibel measures the relative strength of two signals or one signal at two different points. Now, the formula below shows us how to calculate attenuation and how to calculate attenuation using decibel. So a decibel is a negative or decibel is negative if the signal is attenuated and it's positive if the signal becomes amplified. And this is given by 10 log to the base 10 P2 on P1. Now P1 is the initial power and P2 is the final power. So when a signal is being transmitted, the initial power that is used to move the data from one point to the other is P1. Then the P2 is the power that is received at the end of the channel or at the end of the signal. In other words, at the receiver end. So to calculate attenuation, it's 10 times log to the base 10 of the ratio P2 over P1. And that is this formula here. 